meeting to order. It is what time, Brian? It is 8.32. 8.32. If everyone would remember to please turn off their cell phones. We're going to start with a prayer, and Kat Rowalt is going to lead us in prayer today. Please stand. You'd bow your heads, please. Father God, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to come together in your name. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, and we ask, oh, Father, we could sure use some rain. So if you would bring rain in this direction, we would be most appreciative and grateful for it. Father, we thank you for the men and women that you have called to serve our city. Father, we thank you for our first responders and all the men and women that work to keep us safe every day. Father, we ask that you will guide and direct this meeting today, that everything that is said and done will be to your glory, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If we could have Keith Manship of Cub Scout come forward and lead us in the pledge. I would like to have the lake operations crew come forward, please. The City Council of the City of San Angelo hereby recognizes and applauds lake operations team leader James Alley for inspiring and leading his team to make a difference in the community project at Twin Buttes Reservoir along with his dedication to embody the very best of what it means to bear the title public servant. In witness whereof, I have unto set my hand and have caused the official seal to San Angelo to be affixed this 20th day of June, 2017. Congratulations, James. And if you would um, please go ahead and recognize the rest of your crew and give them a certificate, I would appreciate it. He's uh, out with surgery. Okay. I'm sorry, honey. I stood in your way. Uh, Pat Lahan. Elvis Parker. Thank you. And David Garcia.
We are now going to recognize COSA DC for receiving the Texas Economic Development Council's Excellent Award with Roland Pena and his group here. I'm going to turn it over to Roland and let him talk about why they received this recognition. Thank you. I'm going to ask um, our uh, partners who were involved uh, to come up and join us. Howard College, uh, Dr. Cheryl Sparks is here with us today. She's the president of Howard College. Mike Buck with the Contra Valley Workforce uh, Development Board. He's a executive director. If we have anyone here from Shannon Hospital or Community, Community Medical Center. So um, the Texas Economic Development Council is um, a trade organization. It is a profession of economic development professionals. Um, and uh, on uh, the 8th of June, we were recognized for our grassroots efforts. This project, um, uh, recognized by my peers in economic development because of the collaborative effort, the teamwork, uh, the performance measures, and the impact that it has on the community. In 2015, in 2015, uh, the healthcare healthcare industry identified to us that uh, we didn't have enough RNs in the industry. There were 274 openings at the time. Uh, and so we knew that healthcare needed to continue to thrive and survive, and in order to do that, we had to create adequate resources for them, skilled nurses. And so uh, we applied for a grant with the Texas Workforce Commission. Mike Buck led the effort re really here in this community to bring all the partners together. We rallied, and we created startup money of $400,000. Uh, so we now uh, needed to in institute a program. We went to the Board of Nursing, Marnita Quinn uh, is very responsible for that. Uh, for anyone that goes to the Board of Nursing, it's no easy task. Uh, it, it was a major task to do that. We were approved uh, at the time. We went there thinking we would have one program, and we came back with two programs, an associate degree program for RNs and an LVN to RN accelerated program. And I want to show you the result of that today. So I'm going to ask Howard College to, to bring forth their students this is the first class that will graduate in the next month. <laughs> Can't see my name now. Congratulations.
two and a half years, I think. Would the folks for the Texas Hunger Initiative please come forward? Good to see you again. The Texas Hunger Initiative is a collaborative effort, both statewide and locally. Our goal is to end hunger in Texas through policy, education, research, grassroots, organizing, and community development. San Angelo is one of eight Texas cities selected to have a regional office with the dual purpose of promoting child nutrition programs through local outreach and coordination and of working towards the creation of hunger-free community coalitions in the communities within our 23-county region. In Tom Green County, more than one in four families with children had times during the last year when there was not enough money to buy food. That is 5,400 households in San Angelo. The goal for the Tom Green County Hunger Initiative for 2017 is to feed more children during the summer when school is not in session. In San Angelo, over 8,600 students receive free or reduced meals when school is in session, more than 60% of all students. After, school, after summer school ends in June, local churches, ministries, organizations, businesses, and numerous individuals have committed to provide meals in July and August at nine San Angelo neighborhood sites and one site in Carlsbad. There, now, therefore, I, Brenda Gunter, Mayor of the City of San Angelo, on behalf of the City Council, hereby proclaim July 2017 as Kids Eat Free Summer Meals Initiative Month in San Angelo and urge all citizens to support the initiative's, initiative's goal for 2017, Feed the Children, Our City's Future Leaders. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> well, we are very excited. This will be our eighth summer, and we do have 10 sites. Uh, we have still opportunities for volunteers. Uh, if anyone is interested, we have a regional office here, as she mentioned, in the Cactus Hotel. Mary is the regional director, and I'm the child hunger outreach specialist. And uh, we couldn't do this without all of our volunteers and churches and support through our community. And uh, we fed over uh, 12,500 children last summer. So uh, July and August is coming up. The school district is still doing in San Angelo and Grape Creek till June 30th. And I have left some little yellow flyers back on the back table that list all of our meal sites and the churches participating. Please share these with your neighbors and friends and churches and uh, appreciate any support y'all can give us. We are now going into public comment. Issues or items that are not on the agenda may be raised by the public at this time. Citizens should speak from the podium, begin by stating their name, and limit remarks to less than three minutes. Council members may request that a discussed item be placed on a future agenda. The council takes public comment on all regular agenda items during the discussion of those items. Do we have any public comment today? Good morning. My name is Christina DeLeo, a citizen in this city, and I have some large concerns, but I know I'm not alone. First, I'd like to thank you guys because I've been here before, but some new faces up there. So I thank you for your service. We obviously, anybody that's on social media, has a lot of concern and a lot of emotion and passion about what's going on in the city, especially regarding our animals and all the procedures, policies, everything that happens with those and how it relates to the citizens in the community. It takes a village. I heard you say that in a uh, previous meeting that I was watching a video back on and it can't be done alone. The shelter alone can't do it. 
Nobody in charge can do it. It has to be a joint effort with the community, with the shelter, with the rescues. And I know this has, uh, it's been beaten and talked about and nothing has changed. And how long is it gonna go on? How many pets are gonna be killed? How much outrage is gonna be on, going on? And rumors flying around, many that aren't true, some that are. And there's so much going on that people start ignoring it. And I find that unacceptable. The pets deserve better and the community is, deserves better with their tax money. There is several specific incidents that have happened recently and the stories are out there. One is Misty and <laughs> there's a lot of news and stories and sides of the stories for that. But another one is the outrageous fines and fees that needs to be looked at. No one can find that I have talked to and the, the studies and search we have done on the city pages, we can't find the fees that are all laid out there for the public to see. There was an incident lately where two dogs were out of their yard and someone called and by the time the officer arrived, the dogs were in their yard being held by neighbors, but the officer refused to give the owner a chance to comply and laid $700 in fines on them for their dogs not having microchips and being in the front yard. That is, I can't even say what that is. It's ridiculous. In a meeting, Mr. Flores, the director of the shelter, even said that when these fines were laid out, they would be given the chance to comply within a certain amount of time. There are stated incidents where other people have been worked with and have given a chance 10 days to comply to the next month to comply. And yet this owner was not given an hour to comply without getting those fines. It needs to be addressed. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ellen Meyer. Um, I'm in Mr. Hebert's district, and I'm also going to talk about animals. Uh, I was hoping to share this at last week's Animal Shelter Advisory Council meeting, but that meeting was canceled, so I'm going to speak. So first of all, thank you all for serving. Uh, I know I only have three minutes. So here's my story. In 2003, there were 29 feral cats living in a colony behind a popular restaurant. Most of these cats were born there, and a whole bunch of them were dumped there. They were all trapped, taken to a vet to be sterilized and immunized and ear notched so they could be identified as having been fixed and then returned to that location. This is called TNR, trap, neuter, return, TNR. Every time new cats were dumped there, they went through this TNR process and there were a few of them that had um, friendly dispositions that were able to be taken off the colony and adopted. Um, most of them though just lived out their lights there, life there, and they kept that restaurant's rodent population in check, by the way. So I helped to provide regular food and water for this colony for many years with my own money, because I like cats and because I, I don't like seeing any um, living creature suffer. So by 2013, that's just 10 years later, this colony that started with 29 or more cats had dwindled down to four cats. That's an 85-ish 80, percent reduction in the number of wild cats. And by last fall, that colony was empty because the cats there had been through this TNR process, trapped, neutered, and returned to their, their environment. This colony did what a properly maintained colony was supposed to do, it closed. So every single, every single neighborhood in San Angelo has a problem with feral cats living nearby. And a lot of people wanna be humane and will feed these cats, but most people don't bother with trapping them or having them neutered especially these built-in volunteer they're built-in volunteer colony caretakers but they need help from the city i think getting resources uh, to for tnr trapping and neutering and then releasing according to the american humane society this is staggering two cats if left unchecked to reproduce and their offspring continue to breed that's assuming just two litters per year and three kittens per pregnancy, those two cats become 80 million, 80 million cats in just 10 years. So in the 10 years that I helped care for, for my colony behind that restaurant, those 29 cats became zero cats. 
uh, using TNR, trap neuter. So my question is, because nobody wants the nuisance of feral cat infestation, why can't San Angelo's Animal Shelter invest more, a lot more, in TNR, work in conjunction with nonprofit rescue organizations, and do more to educate the public, to train colony caretakers like me, instead of just using our tax money to round up and euthanize these cats? Thank you. Thank you. that was recently euthanized. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. I want to thank y'all for allowing me to speak. I missed his owner, John Strickland. And uh, she was euthanized shortly after she was taken. And I have, like, multiple pictures of her where she doesn't seem to have life-threatening injuries. And right here is a text from 813 that night, or, like two hours later, that Paul sent Robert Diaz. This text never went answered, and they say they couldn't find out who I was. In that building where she was, related to the chip that was in her, was a file. The last interaction that dog had was a file, a piece of paper saying they gave her to me. But they didn't know what I mean. I don't know if what we need to do, but I mean, they killed my dog in a real hurry, saying they couldn't find me, and finding me was 50 feet away in a file cabinet that they had from the chip they installed in her. And I just want to uh, ask that we can uh, look at this. We need to maybe formulate and promulgate some new policy, get some pictures taken or something. Because I know in the old field, we take pictures when something, cause something happens, you know. And uh, that's all I really, I just want everybody to realize that we have a problem and we need to do something about it, please, about that care of the animals. You know, apparently she was taken about 5.30. And I don't know if she was, dead at 8 o'clock or what, but we contacted them and said we had somewhere to take care of her. And they never got a hold of us. And they killed my dog. And I don't know. That's all really I got to say is that we need to try to look at this and try to do something about it, please. Thank, Thank you. you. My name is Laura Harper, and I really wasn't prepared to speak today, but I was asked to read a letter from the people who were fined because they couldn't be here today, so this is their voice. My name is Andy Marquis, and I've recently received four citations from Animal Control in regards to our pets escaping into our neighborhood. As a member of the community who has advocated and raised money for animal rescue in San Angelo, I was aware of the recent law and change in the requirement to have our pets microchipped, and I take full responsibility for not having them compliant. My intention is not to complain about these laws, but to shed light on what happened to us and hopefully be a part of a much needed change in the process. I've served as a member of the board of Concho Valley Paws, raised money for Critter Shack Rescue and Cassie's Place. There is no excuse for not having them chipped, but like most pet owners, I had them collared and tagged with our information and didn't think this would happen to us. We have our dogs rarely vetted and was never pushed to get them chipped. Our dogs recently escaped from the backyard into our neighborhood on Shamrock Drive. We were notified by our neighbor that they were out and were in the process of getting help from our very close friend and also our neighbor, Kelsey Hall, to pick them up. During this time, animal control was called out because our dogs had approached a couple walking their own dog. The responding officer, police officer, was in the area and quickly located our dogs and followed them to our front yard as the dogs were trying to get back in. While in our front yard, the police officer was joined by a total of three different neighbors willing to take possession of our pets. When animal control arrived, they loaded up our senior dogs into the truck parked in our front yard and were prepared to take them to the pound. Our neighbors pleaded to take possession and were not allowed. Then they pleaded for enough time for me to arrive from work and were treated with disrespect and told they couldn't wait. I luckily arrived in time and was given four citations for not complying with city ordinance, one per dog for microchip and one per dog about them being loose. I took the tickets and they released the dogs. During this process, the officer who responded was very kind and suggested <laughs> to animal, animal control that we get a warning for the infractions. It was our plan to fight the tickets for the dogs being loose as our neighbors had taken possession of them. 
My husband called the city to find out what our options were on the tickets. We could not plead we could plead not guilty and appear in court or we could pay seven hundred dollars fine associated with the citations. I was unable to attend the two options for court dates as I was out of state on business and my husband was not allowed to appear on my behalf. The amount of the fine alone was pretty shocking. We paid it and were surprised to see there were not fix and dismiss options. It made us think about those citizens who have made the same mistake we have but didn't have the means to pay such a fine. My husband and I think it's important for animal control to hold a bit more compassion for well-caring vetted pets. There's just a tiny bit more. Go ahead, finish. Do you want me to finish? Yes, please finish. We also think that having a local vet take a stronger action in advocating for compliance of the city ordinance would help to educate the public and get more pets compliant. And lastly, the amount of the fines associated with these infractions is ridiculous. A fix and dismiss option should be given to the pet owner so that they can be compliant with the ordinance and afford to keep their pet. Thank you, Andy and Jeff Marquis. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is John Russell and I own and operate North Concho Veterinary Clinic. I'm here today to tell you about an event that I experienced last week. <clears throat> On Monday morning, a client came in with their dog that had collapsed and passed away suddenly. The dog was two years old and had been adopted from the animal shelter in August of 2016 and according to the owner, had been spayed by the veterinarian that was employed by the city prior to her adoption. The owner was understandably distraught and asked if I could determine the cause of death. The external exam showed a seemingly healthy female dog with marked mammary gland enlargement. I found this odd for a spayed female and made note of it, then proceeded with the internal exam. Internal examination did reveal the cause of death as well as a normal uterus and two ovaries. You may or may not know, but when a female dog or cat is spayed, the entire reproductive tract is removed. That is the uterus and the ovaries. The reproductive tract played no part in the tragic death of this patient, but nonetheless, I found its presence concerning. I hope that this is a unique incident, but I feel it important to let you and the citizens of San Angelo know so that they can be sure that any pets that they adopted are in fact spayed. Otherwise, these pets will continue to reproduce, leading to more unwanted litters. Additionally, as a practitioner of veterinary medicine, it is important to know the status of pets I'm treating. Improper information may lead to potentially life-threatening delay in diagnosis and treatment. I would put before the council that a letter be sent to all adoptees from the time period uh, involved advising them to have their pets examined by a veterinarian to ascertain that the pets are in fact sterilized. I would further suggest that the city pick up any cost inferred by the adoptees for these exams and to have this pet spayed if needed. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. My name is Jim Black. I'm a retiree and I chose to spend a significant amount of my time and money towards animals. I personally am not involved with any of the rescues but as one individual, I have given several thousand dollars in different ways. I have personally, one way or another, adopted over 40 animals out of that shelter. I've done it by paying, uh, going to the mobile uh, trailer and paying for dogs there. I have walked in the shelter and left money with them to pay for dogs. I have probably at my house somewhere around 10 that have came out of that shelter personally. So to me, it's not about the dog, uh, the, the other stuff that's going on, it's about the dogs. I have watched the shelter personally, I believe, slowly deteriorate to the point they have no desire to work with the local rescues. And that's really sad because there was a time when people came in there and uh, the rescues were and taking pictures and videos of the dogs and networking them. Jennifer McCann, who I also gave money to, raised over $10,000 in just one event and almost emptied that shelter. But the, the division between this is our, our shelter and you rescues are interfering with us and bothering us has reached the point where I've decided to stand up and say something. 
I think that shelter has the ability to be one of the finest in the country. But there's got to be a change, I believe, in management and attitudes of what, go, what goes on over there. If I, I'm almost 70 years old. If I were going to run that shelter tomorrow, I would have every rescue in this country around here in there, and we'd, have, we'd talk about it and we'd formulate a plan. There wouldn't be none of this I and you. It would be us. And that's not going on. That's not going on. I have heard remarks. I have seen things that slowly have reached that point where I've decided I'm going to take a stand. And I have done that. And one of the things that bothers me a lot is that when this contract was sent out to Paul's, and I have nothing bad to say about Paul's, I was told that it was sent to all the rescues. And the rescues did not get a letter. I have here a letter from San Angelo on, on their letterhead that states where those contracts went out to. Not one local person, local rescue, got that except Paul's. And Paul's had a representative on that animal shelter advisory board. Now, that may be okay, but it sure doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. Now, I think we're all going to be held responsible when we stand before God for the way we treat each other and we treat our animals. And I think that shelter out there could be the finest in the country, but there's got to be a change. It cannot be them versus us. can't be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Sharon Hoffman. Um, I too intended to speak before the Animal Advisory Board last Thursday. Even though I took off work and got there, the, the meeting was canceled, so I'm going to say what I was going to say to them to you. I, I plan to say I had not been present at the recent board meetings, but I understand that y'all, the Advisory Board, is, are trying to implement mandatory registration of community cats. I wanted to ask them, what is their objective in this mandatory registration? The current ordinance provides for steps for the city or the shelter to follow if a person in the city limits is feeding cats but is not practicing trap neuter return. If you believe that the responsible caretakers who are currently practicing TNR and doing their very best to spay, neuter, vaccinate the cats in their neighborhoods are a problem for the city or for the shelter, let me correct your assumption. These men and women are not only using their funds and their time to trap, to transport to the vets, to spay, neuter, vaccinate, recover, feed, provide medical care for, and look out for the these cats will being there also doing their best to educate their neighbors <coughs> and their friends about the benefits of TNR and they're sharing their success stories with people all over town. We spoke before the city council several months ago about some of the successes that we have seen. At our clinic, we work with these caretakers daily to provide, <coughs> to provide low cost sterilizations for cats. We see firsthand how dedicated they are. We offer advice, we offer help, we offer assistance. Um, it's amazing what education, advice, websites, some information can do to further people's education about trap need to return. If an effort is underway to try to encourage a no or a low kill concept here, then in any kind of research you see that the first two things that must happen are a citywide supported TNR program because the majority of the, cat, the, majority of the animals killed at the shelter are cats, feral, community, tame, whatever. And also access to a high volume, low cost spay neuter program. And the last and most important step, according to Nathan Winograd, is a hardworking, compassionate animal control shelter director not content to continue killing. The implementation of a city supported TNR program and a city supported high volume, low cost spay neuter program is necessary to reduce these cat numbers and to re reduce the total number of animals killed here each month. We've been working with community cat takers for 16 years. We started having free clinics um, to, in 2001. We work with caretakers on a daily basis. We know these people. They are not wanting to register with the city. They're not wanting to pay a fee to the city. They just want to do what they're doing. What we need to do is to offer assistance, advice, education, not, not fines and not threats. Um, many cities, such as Garland, uh, do what I'm asking that y'all consider doing. They, the city pays for all sterilizations for a trap neuter return program. And it, worked, and it has worked amazingly well. Um, we would encourage the city of San Angelo to follow Garland's example. When we see what cities, caretakers, and rescue groups who work together can achieve, we're encouraged and we believe that a citywide TNR program is a real possibility. Thank you. Thank you very much.
morning, Mayor Gunter and City Council. Morning. I'm Kristen Stanley. I too did not have the opportunity to speak at the Animal Services uh, Committee meeting last week, so I'd like to read what I was going to say last week. Um, I'd like to address the issue of mandatory registration of community cat colonies that has been pushed by the ASAC for the last few months. Implementing mandatory registration re would result in fewer cats being spayed, neutered, and vaccinated, which are the very goals of TNR, trap, neuter, return. Mandatory registration of colony cats would only penalize those of us who have opened our hearts and wallets to care for community cats, and we are the core of an effective TNR program. Managed sterilized colonies are a small fraction of the total number of our community cats. Mandatory registration would fail to address the unaltered free-roaming community cats found in every neighborhood that do not live in colonies. Today, TNR programs have evolved, which operate on an unprecedented scale. In Albuquerque, New Mexico, a community cats project administered by Best Friends included TNR of thousands of free-roaming cats a year for three years. Cat intake at the local shelter dropped by 83%. New forms of TNR have also been developed, like return to field, in which healthy free-roaming cats admitted to shelters are fixed and returned to their, their locations rather than being admitted and euthanized. Garland, Texas has a sponsoring model ordinance similar to our <coughs> ordinance. Colony caretakers register with the sponsoring organization Possibilities, not with the city of Garland. Registration is not mandatory, there's no fee, and Possibilities, the sponsoring organization, keeps the colony locations confidential. Brenda Jackson, a volunteer with Possibilities and the TNR coordinator, states in an email, we have over 170 registered colonies. There is no fee or application, and Garland is unique in that the city of Garland pays for all TNR sterilizations. El Paso, Texas is experiencing a lot of success at curtailing the overpopulation of community cats. Esti Molina, the community programs manager for the city of El Paso, writes in an email, we hired a community cat coordinator, a PR rep, additional veterinary staff. Animal control officers stopped picking up cats and less injured and started canvassing the community in order to educate the public on the benefits of TNR rather than issuing citations. Our updated ordinance permits free roaming community cats and does not require caretaker registration. Ms. Molina goes on, it has been proven over and over again that requiring caretakers to register will reduce those willing to care for our community cat colonies. Legislative schemes such as mandatory registration, which overregulate TNR, have the potential of stifling this kind of success and innovation. Best Friends and Pet Smart Charities award TNR grants to cities that have innovative TNR practices, such as Albuquerque, New Mexico, El Paso, and Garland, Texas. Best Friends also has taken the position against mandatory registration. The city of San Angelo must not place more restrictions on TNR, such as mandatory registration. Now is the time for our city to look toward other cities for progressive, innovative TNR programs. Now is the time for our city shelter to lead the community in adopting TNR. Thank you. Thank you. Further comment? Good morning, Council. Ryan Kramer, Superintendent of Fleet Services. Just wanted to remind our public that we have a surplus vehicle and equipment auction that's active right now. Uh, it is available for bidding up until uh, June 27th, uh, so please uh, look into that if anyone is interested. Um, we have one more viewing date, a physical viewing date, and that is this Friday, so we would encourage anyone to schedule an appointment to do that. Uh, that can be found on the website of ReneeBates.com. Uh, or you can call our office uh, and we can give you more information at 657-4329. Thank you. Mayor, I just wanted to point out that uh, Animal Services Committee meeting did not make because of a lack of quorum. Correct. So I just wanted to make sure that you know, everybody understood that. Any further comment on any issues? We will now move into uh, the consent agenda. Um, Lane, do you have anything you want to pull from the consent agenda? I have nothing to pull, but I do have a comment. Uh, it goes along the lines with all of the discussion we've had this morning. There's one thing that comes next to messing with a person's children and messing with their pets. So I'd like to put on for future a discussion for a thorough look at all of our policy and procedures involving our animal services 
and our fees along with the animal shelter. Lucy? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'd like to pull item D, please. Gary? Nothing to pull. Tommy? Nothing to pull. Tommy? No, ma'am. Okay. Yes. Um, just an announcement, Charlotte Farmer is ill today, and that's the reason she is not here today. Lane, you want to discuss, um, or no, Lucy, you want to discuss? Yes, I just wanted to hear. I more or less wanted to know what this was about. What did it entail? Carl, are you here? Yeah. Uh, we need we need to Motion. go ahead and pass the rest of the uh, consent agenda first. Okay. Well, we're going to take a break here and change the agenda yeah. and say the following. Do I have a motion to approve the rest of the items on the consent agenda? Move. Move. All in Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes 6-0. Okay, now, Carl, would you like to talk about item D? <clears throat> yes, Mr. Wayne Nickel has been running his business, Contra Cruises, at Lake Nasworthy for several years. We recently uh, renewed his agreement, I think about a year, year and a half ago, and he has um, wanted to sell that operation. Debbie Albert is the, um, the agent that's working that sell. Uh, they've found potential new owners, and we can't assign that agreement without city council's authorization. That's why we're bringing it to you. Okay. It's going to change of owners. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion on item D? We'll move to vote. All in favor of approving item D? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. We'll move into the regular agenda. Um, John James, if you want to come forward, it'll be the first reading and public hearing for case Z17-05, an ordinance approving a request for a rezoning from the single family residential RS1 zoning district to the office commercial zoning district located at 1920 South Johnson Street on 0.431 acres. Thank you. Uh, John James, Director of Planning and Development Services. Uh, this is a rezoning, uh, as you mentioned, from single-family residential to office. Uh, you can see the location there on the map on Johnson. This is it's basically surrounded by uh, the ASU campus. Um, the future land use, of course, uh, for this entire area is campus institutional, uh, but the zoning you can see for the area is single-family. Um, it, it's not uncommon for schools and in this case the university uh, to be zoned uh, part of the larger residential neighborhood surrounding um, but this particular use is no longer allowed within the residential district uh, and so the church uh, we consider it a church use it's a student uh, center for uh, religious um, activities uh, on campus uh, although technically it's it's owned by the church not the university so it's not uh, strictly on campus um, but the rezoning from the single family to the office commercial will allow this use to continue legally. Uh, it will no longer be a non-conforming use, uh, and this will allow them to pursue some expansion on the property uh, that they uh, foresee in the, in the near future. A rationale for approval, again, it is uh, uh, campus institutional for the land use designation. Uh, the use serves the campus, and so it, it just makes sense. Uh, residential zoning, these previously were residential lots, as you can see on the map. Uh, they were carved up to be developed residentially, but, but they weren't uh, developed that way, uh, and we see no negative impacts. Uh, we did send out our notifications to the surrounding property owners, uh, most of which is the university itself, and did not receive any responses in favor or in opposition. So uh, what is before you is the rezoning. Uh, staff does recommend approval, as did the Planning Commission uh, unanimously. Be happy to answer any questions. Do I have any questions from Council? Just one, John. We're going, is it, is it normal to go f on this type of situation from, from the residential to the commercial office? Is that 
I guess, the, the best practices to do that? Uh, yes, that's the, uh, it's a, a relatively low intensity district that will allow the church use. It could you know, in the future could allow some uh, office type uses, but it wouldn't open it up to uh, more intensive type retail commercial, uh, largely if if this use ever went away uh, to go to something else. Okay, that was going to be my net, and that you answered the question in. So th- it it's going to keep it at a at a fairly uh, low intensity. Should the religious activities ever cease to exist there? Correct. The that office commercial district is is limited to lighter retail and office type okay. uses. Thank you. Any further comment? Do I have a motion to approve? Move to approve as presented. Second. Second. Any public comment? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes 6-0. <laughs> Item B, first reading and public hearing for case Z1704, an ordinance approving a request for a rezoning from single family resident zoning district to manufactured housing subdivision located at 2101 Mark Street. John? Thank you. Again, John James, Director of Planning and Development Services. Uh, this uh, is a request from rezoning from single family to mobile home or manufactured home subdivision. Uh, the location is the corner of Marks and 21st Street. Future land use map does show this as a neighborhood. Uh, much of all of the surrounding area, in fact, is uh, some form of uh, residential development. Uh, the current property, as well as most of the surrounding property, is single family uh, residential zoning. Uh, you can see there is right across the street a small area, a couple of lots of multifamily uh, residential RM1, which is the low intensity multifamily, could allow things like duplexes or uh, something like that. Uh, this is the property. Uh, you can see uh, a mobile home uh, existing on the property. So there, there is a mobile home on the property that is uh, legal nonconforming, meaning that it's no longer allowed on the property, but the existing use can continue basically grandfathered for as long as it sits there. Uh, if that is removed under the current zoning on the property, a new manufactured home could not be placed onto the property. Uh, any new home built under the current zoning uh, would have to be a single-family st- uh, on-site built home or a modular home on the property. Uh, it's just looking at the surrounding area, looking across the street and down Mark Street. And then just, this is uh, sort of backing up to that property. The, the property in question is, is kind of back behind uh, these homes, but this is just showing about a block away is a strip of uh, two or three uh, brand new site built homes in the neighborhood. Uh, our analysis, uh, we looked at compatibility with plans and policies. The manufactured home subdivision uh, zoning uh, was changed in the year 2000. Before that, uh, a manufactured home like this could seek council approval as an individual case by case review. Uh, should a manufactured home be allowed in the middle of a single-family neighborhood. Uh, In 2000, the council chose to change the ordinance to say that moving forward, uh, manufactured homes should only be allowed within a mobile home park or a manufactured home subdivision. Uh, In other words, an individual manufactured home shouldn't be placed in the middle of a single-family neighborhood but should be part of an overall larger-scale development of manufactured homes. So in that respect, we don't believe this is consistent with the current zoning ordinance. Um, Given that direction in that ordinance, we also don't believe that it's uh, compatible with the surrounding area. Uh, Again, the policy direction in the ordinance that we currently have is that manufactured homes should be in their designated areas uh, outside of single-family neighborhoods. Uh, I just mentioned this, the change conditions in 2000 is when that ordinance was changed. Uh, Newer homes in the area have been built, and so uh, there is a pattern in the area where either vacant lots or teardowns and reconstructions have occurred with new single-family homes uh, on-site, you know, site-built single-family homes. Uh, 
and again, the development pattern in the area largely is uh, on-site stick-built single-family homes. Uh, this is just a brief uh, overview of the difference between what's a modular home, manufactured home, and a mobile home. Um, modular homes, as you know, we recently amended the ordinance to make some changes into what modular homes, um, where they can be. Basically, modular home can go anywhere a single family uh, home is allowed, uh, and largely that's because it's built to the International Building Code. Uh, versus manufactured homes uh, are built to the HUD code, which is a federal requirement, uh, which is a different standard for construction uh, and slightly lower standard for uh, quality of construction. That's not to say that these homes aren't well built. It's just a different uh, level of, uh, of standard that they have to meet. A uh, mobile home is what we call any manufactured home built before 1977. Um, and at that time is when HUD adopted a federal standard that applies throughout the country uh, for manufactured homes. And so anything built before that, there was a hodgepodge of standards. Uh, and so uh, if you think of those older homes, those may not have been built to a higher quality standard versus modern day manufactured homes are built to a higher standard. This is just the immediate vicinity. You can see in green are the houses, the new houses that have been built since 2011, uh, and also in yellow are existing uh, mobile or manufactured homes within the neighborhood. So those three uh, yellow show existing uh, manufactured homes that are also legal nonconforming. If those go away, they would have to be replaced in this neighborhood with a uh, on-site built single-family home or a modular home. I uh, wanted to zoom out a little more to show you the larger area, uh, basically showing the same thing, but one of the reasons we wanted to, to zoom out a little more is to show this orange uh, mobile home or manufactured home subdivision uh, that is located uh, relatively nearby. It's, it's a little ways away. Uh, you can see the subject property is, is right here, uh, and also the yellow shows other existing uh, nonconforming uh, mobile homes. Uh, pink, those show the special permit mobile homes. As I mentioned before 2000, uh, the council could approve a special permit for an individual property to place a manufactured home on that property. So all those in pink were those approvals. Uh, all of those in this area occurred between 1976 and 1984. Uh, there's one blue that that was a special permit. Uh, rather than just give them a permit uh, indefinitely, uh, that permit actually had an expiration date, and that one expired in, in 1985. We did send out uh, notice. Don, can we, yes. we, let's go back one slide. Sure. It's just for clarification. Yeah. Uh, all of these in the yellow and pink and then one individual in, in, in blue, if those homes should, should go away, they would not be allowed to have a mobile or manufacturing home on that particular property per the ordinance. Is that correct? Well, for the yellow and blue, for the pink, they do have a permit to permit a mobile home uh, on that property. And let me check with Rebecca, but I believe that those special permits allow them to replace those homes. Uh, so those were an indefinite approval for a manufactured home on that property. Um, if, if those go away, they can be replaced. That, to me, sounds a little inconsistent on how we, how we would moving forward. I mean, this neighborhood or this area that we've got shown on the map have a number of those, those special <coughs> permitted spots where there are a number of the other ones that are not the yellow and, of course, the one we're talking about this morning. So uh, I, I think whatever decision this council makes today, we need to go back and revisit how we, how we do the uh, manufactured mobile homes, whatever the case may be. Sure. And just, just to follow up on that a, a bit, I think that's the thought the council had in 2000. Um, and when they looked at it at that time, they said, no, let's, let's get away from approving these individually. Let's just go back to uh, strict straight zoning that says, in these areas you have manufactured homes, in these areas you have mobile homes, and, and the two shouldn't mix. Um, and that's, you know, there's no magic in that. Uh, that's not the way we have to do it as a city, but that's the way uh, in the past our current ordinance has been written is to 
basically separate uh, those two types of uses, but with the exception of allowing those that had already gotten those special permits to continue uh, indefinitely. Lucy, do you have a comment? Yes, I want to know, um, James, um, I'm sorry, Jeff, for his degree. Um, I need to ask you, so what do we need to do? Do we need to go back and do a case-by-case -case to where we can give this uh, constituent a special permit to move in this modular home since he has been living there? Um, what, he was uh, asked to replace the his 1959 mobile home with he that's what he's wanting to do he's wanting to replace a 1959 mobile home with a new 130,000 HUD certified manufacturer home which really to me in the way I see it is if I know that he got grandfathered in I know that you know y'all did all this but now 17 years later I want to see it be spe him be approved a special use so that he can update where he lives with the new modular home and um, I've seen pictures of it and it's really nice and I don't think that we have gotten any uh, people saying that they didn't want this and I also understand that we want we don't want to keep making that residential area into a mobile home also that's why I'm asking if we possibly could do the special permit and do it from now on with a case by case what people may bring before us and we can say yes you can do this versus a no absolutely not yeah and in, in just a second I'll get to a slide that talks about some options and one of those options is asking staff to come back with with some changes to the ordinance uh, do you know if we've denied any request, say, in the past five, seven years to put in a mobile home in this area? And we've denied, and, and what I'm looking at is consistency here. I'm not aware. Since I've been here, we've not had one of these come up. I will say that we've had, um, we get a number of requests. Um, so while this is fairly unique, uh, we do get questions uh, two or three a month of people wanting to place uh, a manufactured home in a neighborhood where they're not allowed. And generally when we tell them that, they say, well, okay, it's it's not worth the hassle. I'll either find someplace else or, or build a site-built home. But okay, it sounds like it's we have not had any within that, that, that last few years. Uh, again, this is a fairly onerous process, uh, we understand, to go through um, to get approval for something like this. Uh, and I don't say that to disparage the process. I say that, that the council purposefully put in this process uh, at the time to discourage manufactured homes in neighborhoods like this. And if, uh, back to Ms. Gonzalez's question, if, if that's something you no longer think is the appropriate ordinance for the community, uh, then we can definitely go back and look at options, including case-by-case -case review or more broadly allowing manufactured homes in neighborhoods similar to how we just recently changed the ordinance for modular homes. But the yellow and pink are mobile homes, not manufactured homes. Well, not, necess mobile homes. not necessarily. We, in some ways, we use that term interchangeably, but these on this map. But on map, your previous slide, you showed the difference between mobile homes and manufactured homes. Right. These so are, are these, these mobile are or are these non-conforming? I would guess that most of them, given the age of the neighborhood, are mobile homes. Yes, the, the pink are all mobile homes because th those were those old special permits from the 70s and 80s. Uh, but some of the yellow could be newer homes, uh, but they would have been before 2000 because that's when the ordinance changed. Mobile home, not manufactured home. The majority of them w are likely mobile homes, correct? There we don't could have be, a specific. We don't know for sure Because which we looked of those. at a slide that specifically talked about the difference between manufactured and mobile. So when we look at this slide, we need to know that this slide's information ties back into the slide that said mobile versus manufactured because there's differences. Right, and for this slide, we surveyed the neighborhood to see if there was a, a, a manufactured or mobile home on the property. Um, we did For each of those homes, we did not go back and find out the age of the home when it was permitted to know whether it was a mobile or manufactured home. So, John, the, the, the mobile versus manufactured really has to do with the age of that particular unit. Is that correct? 
when the unit was constructed. So in some sense, yes, the age, because a, a mobile home technically hasn't been constructed since 1977. Okay, so that we get clarification. Right. I mean, I think, I think if we were talking about a modular home, we would not be having this long discussion because a modular home, based on what we've learned and what the council did in, back in April or May, is something that's built to stouter uh, requirements, and the bottom line is it can be placed in any RS1 or RS2 uh, with, a, with a few uh, qualifications. Is that correct? Correct. All right. So difference between the manufacturing and modular simply has to do with the way it was constructed. Correct. And the standard, yeah, the standards to which it had to meet, meet at that time. We did send out our notifications to the surrounding properties. We uh, did not receive any responses in favor or in opposition. And so here are really the options before you. If, if you believe that manufactured homes are inappropriate for single family neighborhoods, similar to what the council adopted in 2000, then you would simply deny this request and keep the ordinance as is and move on. Uh, if you believe this manufactured is home is okay at this location and also meets that general purpose of the current ordinance, you would just approve this request and we'd be done. Uh, on the other hand, if you believe that manufactured homes should generally be allowed in single family neighborhoods, um, then what we would ask is that you approve this request, but then direct staff to go back and, and revisit the manufactured home regulations. And we would come back to you at a future date with some recommendations. Uh, if, if that's your option, we'd like a little bit of feedback on whether you would prefer case-by-case -case review or more generally opening up neighborhoods to uh, manufactured homes in general. Uh, but again, that would largely be a discussion for another day. We would just seek that direction uh, to come back in, in the future. This brought before the Planning Commission? This item was brought before the Planning Commission. Uh, they did not have, uh, they had very little, if any, discussion on, on this option because at the time they believed that this was the appropriate uh, response. They recommended denial of the request. Now, I, I will say um, they didn't believe it was their job to question the council's direction in terms of the ordinance. So I, I, I wouldn't go so far to say that they believe that manufactured homes shouldn't necessarily be allowed in, in all single-family neighborhoods. They thought that was more of a question for this council rather than themselves. So what is before you is a rezoning for this one property from single-family residential to a manufactured home subdivision. Uh, staff did recommend denial based on the previous policies of the council, and the Planning Commission also recommended denial, although it was a 4-2 vote. Uh, I will note that a supermajority is required. Anytime the Planning Commission recommends denial of a case, it triggers a supermajority vote of the council. Uh, that supermajority is of the entire council, which would be six of seven. Uh, even though there are only six of you here, it, it does re still require six votes to approve. Could you go back to the previous screen, please? Right. I would move that we look at it as far as um, ask you uh, to go back and look at the changes to, for the ordinance to be a case-by-case -case situation. That um, we can we can be told ahead of time what is going to be moving in into that residence. This uh, gentleman that is wanting to up grade his home um, is a Vietnam veteran. He's 100% disabled. Um, I think that in our community we have always gone out to do our best to help these veterans out and I believe now is the time to help him in my district and do this. Uh, the guy's never lived anywhere else and I know that 17 years ago we couldn't couldn't change the fact that he had this mobile home. Now he's updating. Um, Mr. Beam has been helping him out. Um, he has taken interest in him, and I find that to be great for this gentleman. I want to do what we can as a council and help this man out, and that's why I'm asking if we could possibly um, go back 
and um, look at the changes of the ordinance to either single family neighborhood, either by right or by case by case. I agree with Lucy. Um, this, I view this as a case by case. No, I don't want to see and set the precedence of having a single family home going to manufactured, but this has been been a manufactured slash mobile home before. So going back with a newer, improved one would be an improvement essentially in this district, um, in that neighborhood. So uh, if we need to go back and look at for a special case by case, that way it doesn't set a precedent citywide, but to approve this, to allow him to upgrade from what he has now to a newer, better built manufactured home. Further Sorry, comment? Do you, think, do you think that this, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, do you think that this is going, this wouldn't have anything to do with decreasing the property value in the surrounding area, do you think? Uh, no, in, given the, yeah. the home that he's proposed and, and the, you know, the values in the surrounding area, um, I, I wouldn't think that this would devalue surrounding properties. Will this home be put on a foundation? It does not have to be. That's one of the differences between manufactured homes and site-built homes. Um, so we don't we don't currently have requirements for that. Just a question out of curiosity on my part, John. Did did was there any discussion as to the amount of money to be spent and why it would be spent on this and not to build the you call it as you call it the stick home? Foundation subject to international building code standards. It said, did, what, did any of that come out? There hadn't been uh, at the planning commission level. There wasn't much discussion of that aspect of it. Although, either the applicant or a representative of the applicant is here today, and they may be able to answer that question: why they chose that that route. I guess I would ask very similar questions. I mean, we just did the modular thing, at one hundred thirty thousand dollar manufactured home is a lot of money. I sus suspect that there's a m many modular homes out there that you can get for that particular amount. So I, I, I guess I'd have to ask that question. Do we know how big this particular unit is that is being proposed? Um, but not off the top of my head, but yes, the applicant can, okay. can address that. They, we, we have that information or they have that information. I believe this manufactured home is okay at this location and meets the purpose of the zoning ordinance. Any further comment? Well, as we sit and look at this, I mean, council went through and they made ordinances and I think when you sit back and we look at the, the overall picture, we make an ordinance for a population, not for a specific person, okay? and. I wonder if we've denied any people that have also wanted to do something similar to that. It doesn't show any consistency, or maybe we have, maybe we haven't. So we don't know if we've been consistent or not consistent, which is a concern there. Now, I do agree with you. The one special, um, or this gentleman's special condition and where he's lived is, is a huge thing in here, Mayor. But I just kind of sit on the air and I wonder, you know, what we open ourselves up to in the future. I mean, we've set this, we want to be consistent um, we've made this for a population and a community, not for one specific place. I just think we need to keep that in mind as we move forward. But I do understand the, the unique situ situation with this one person. And that's just it. It's unique. And that's why I think that when we look at things, we need to look at a case-by-case -case situation. That would prevent having a single-family home being torn down to put a modular home or a manufactured home in that spot. If it's zoned for a single family resident, then it's going to be considered that. But because this has been a manufactured home already, uh, and one of the 1959 was that when this was built, mm. you can you can consider this an upgrade, appearance wise and potentially appraisal wise. I drove around last night and looked at the surrounding properties as well as the block um, that the home sits on. And I truly believe that this $130,000 modular home 
manufactured home would increase the value of surrounding properties at this point in time. Um, I don't believe it, I think it's very difficult to, to create an ordinance that applies to all single family neighborhoods because all neighborhoods and surrounding areas are not the same. The case by case also would give the council the opportunity to consider all those things we've talked about, the surrounding neighborhood, what has taken place in the past five years, but also over the past 50 years. So I'm, I am leaning toward option number three myself, um, just because I think we need I think we need that opportunity to have a, 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 a little more input into the process because there could be some cases that they're just totally not appropriate and like this one that are appropriate. So, so Tommy, you're suggesting that we uh, approve this request and then that we direct staff to look at appropriate changes to the ordinance down the road. That's my thought, Mayor. Okay. Do you want to make a motion of that? I'm Mayor. Oh, sorry. I can't we, we actually have that exact motion from um, Councilmember Gonzalez and Lucy a second by Carter. So we will need a second then. And you got it. Dane, Dane, Dane seconded it. And then we need a comment. Uh, comment. Let me make one point uh, along those lines. The, one of the benefits of the case by case is that you could place conditions on those approvals. With this rezoning, although this particular applicant has a particular home in mind, you're simply, by approving this, you're approving manufactured home zoning on this property. There's no guarantee that they wouldn't, couldn't put a different home, uh, smaller home, less expensive home. So I know they've got pictures of the home in question, and we know the value is 130000 This action does not guarantee any of that. It's simply rezoning the property for any manufactured home that they would want to put on there. So do we need, are you saying that we need to put some stipulations on this specifically? Well, today with straight zoning, you're not allowed to place stipulations, and so that would be the benefit of, in the future, changing the ordinance for an individualized review that could allow for conditions. So, John, it's my understanding then that the individual has not purchased this home yet? I, my understanding was that they have, but I think the applicant can speak to that better than I can. That was my understanding of what they said at the Planning Commission meeting, but I may have heard that incorrectly. Well, I guess I, what I'm trying to say is, is if they haven't purchased it, maybe they ought to look at the modular situation, which already fits in our ordinance. And that's something that the applicant, I'm, I'm sure, can answer. Do we have any further public comment on this issue? Good morning. Um, I just have, I've been listening to all this and coming and going, and, uh, We, sir, can we have your name, please? Do what now? Your name, your name, please. Oh, my name is Armando Vasquez, and I am one of the past presidents of the Contra Valley Vietnam Veterans, and our motto stands for what we are. We're together in war, and we're now together in peace, and so, we went as individuals and came back as brothers, so we're going to do everything we can for any one of our veteran brothers. That's just the way we are. But it, this, this kind of reminds me of the gentleman over here, Tom, Tom yes, said something about we need to look at what this is going to lead to us in the future. Once before I've heard this from the city council, and that's when we wanted the Vietnam Veteran Memorial to be placed, or we were going to build it, at the Sunken Gardens, right across the bridge where uh, the, our only POWMIA, Lewis Farr Jones, that bridge was dedicated to him. And that word was said. And then it broke out into, well, look at the kind of people we're going to have downtown looking at this, meaning us. We were kind of scaggly at that time. We had, some of us had beard, long hair, whatever, and peace signs everywhere. But look at the, uh, the people that are going to be hanging around there. Do we want this? 
and we've got voted down. We got voted down twice. Eventually, the city gave us that little property right out, right at the entrance of the airport. That's where our memorial stands. It shouldn't have to have been out there, but that's fine. We're grateful, and we're grateful for what you have done for us. We're grateful for the American people of what they finally have accepted us, not as a stepchild, but as somebody that fought for our country, whether we liked it or not. We've come a long ways, and because of what we have done for each other and our benefits and all, the new veterans now coming home have all these benefits that took us so long to get, including when they come home, some I cities. Stay focused on this uh, conversation, please, on the manufactured home okay. issue, not a broader scale right. of conversation. The, the, the question was uh, asked, did, has he bought the house? Yes. He won't sit home. He's ready to go. He lives in a little trailer house. I mean, it's more of a camper. He added a, a little uh, room to make it into a living room. This is what he's got all this time. And now he wants to make something nice. His benefits have finally come in after all these years. He's gotten 100% disabled. And he's had several surgeries. And he wants to make it right. So we are asking you to just consider the, the fight that this man has gone through and what he wants to do. He wants to make something beautiful that is not in, you know, in thank contrast you with much. others. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, thank you for your service and thank you for all of y'all in the audience for your service. I'm told I can pass it out. Um, I'm going to need some help up here. Well, I'll, let's leave that. I don't know how to use these. I'm a photographer, not an audiovisual guy. Um, I need to tell you on um, good morning, uh, Mayor and Council. My name is Jim Bean. I'm very proud of San Angelo. It's my hometown. And I'm going to take a little break from my canned presentation. remind you to ask me any questions you want at the end of this. This is a very fragmented project, has a lot of different value aspects, has a lot of different issues with definitions. And if you haven't researched it thoroughly, it won't make a lot of sense and it can be distracting. So meanwhile, back to my presentation. When you have the opportunity to talk to someone that has moved to San Angelo or visits San Angelo or perhaps has retired in San Angelo, they all say the same thing. You've heard it. Here's what they say. They say, the people here are friendly. And most importantly, they say everyone is helpful. You've heard that. Except for four years serving in the United States Navy, Otis Woodfin lived his entire life at the same address on Mark Street and 21st in North San Angelo. Mr. Woodfin is a 100% disabled veteran. He's living in a 1959 era mobile home. We've already discussed the 130,000 HUD certified manufactured home. That's a definition that's important later if you have some questions. And he wants to replace his current dwelling. If council were to approve this request, there would be no problems with the neighborhood or the city. As a matter of fact, to the best of my knowledge, 100% of the neighbors there, 100% of the landowners are in 100% agreement with this process. These are some signed affidavits from the property owners. I'm going to read one to you. 
I, Rufino Garcia, am the sole owner of the following property, 2022 Marks. I welcome the owner of the property at 2101 Mark Street here in San Angelo to locate a manufactured home on his property. I want the San Angelo Planning Department, the San Angelo Planning Commission, and the San Angelo City Council to know that I am in total agreement with this project. Let me share a few similar facts that are in the overall plan of San Angelo. The purpose and final result of this request is consistent with the plans and policies put forth by our city council. Mr. Woodfin is upgrading an existing family residence to a much more modern, more safe, and more aesthetically pleasing structure. This upgrade will enhance the visible impact, the curb appeal of the existing neighborhood. That's when you're supposed to look at that picture. 17 years ago, and that's important, technology has advanced. Things have changed, times have changed, definitions have changed, or should be changed. 17 years ago, the ordinance were modified and no longer allow a very common thing that was called remove and replace. Those were options for homeowners. Also, to my understanding, is that they also remove council's ability to offer an option of variance. According to our planning department, and that's how this began, Mr. Woodfin's only option is for council to approve this simple, small-scale zone change that will accommodate the needs of our city, the neighborhood, and the property owner. The failure of our ordinances is not your failure. Technology moves far faster than the most progressive city government. Jim, your three minutes is up. Can you wrap it up? Yes, I'll just, this will wrap it up here then. John Jones, James, excuse me, I've been calling him Jones for too long, I'm sorry. <clears throat> John jo James, our planning director, has several good ideas for addressing similar future needs to allow manufactured homes within certain specific neighborhoods here in San Angelo. I suggest that you offer him the opportunity to research other cities' approaches and basically cut to the end. I'm asking you to vote for this, and I'm asking the person that makes the motion to also suggest to other council members to vote unanimously to approve this, reinforcing our city's reputation of supporting our citizens, neighborhoods, and especially supporting our veterans. Questions? Any further questions? Thank you. Make a real quick comment, uh, especially since Amanda was here. I'm also a Vietnam era veteran, disabled, not 100% like this gentleman is out here. So I feel for what, what he's going through right now. We've got to make a decision that will allow him to stay on that property, upgrade that neighborhood, but in the same token, we've got to do it in such a way that we don't make this automatic to every place in the community. And I run through these images right quickly. There's only 10 or 11 more. Okay, that's okay. Uh, an interior, another interior. This is an upscale property. There are no issues with code. There we go, pretty nice place. This is the person across the street that has a variance or the variable prop, um, zoning that 100% his name is Soto, supports this. Here are the neighborhoods across the street. Not going to spend all day. There's some commercial you see. You know where this turns off 14. You're familiar with that. There are the rent properties that we're talking about, new construction. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Further public comment, please.
Good morning. My name is Tom Bright. Yes, uh, we know this gentleman. He's been there since 1959. That's his only home he's ever had, and he'll probably die there. Uh, he could go to the orange area up there where all the trailer houses are already. Uh, but it, I think he feels like he's been sent from his home to the reservation. Why does he want a, a ma manufactured home like this? Maybe it's the first time in his life that he could actually have something when he dies that he could give his family and they, can, they could take it and put it wherever they want to. Maybe that's why the people in the orange area have mobile homes. Should uh, areas happen that they can't stay here or need to move that they could and wouldn't have to go to the hassle of trying to sell a, a home as the market is kind of sorry right now for doing that. Uh, if you look at that house, uh, he mows it, it's clean. The, the lot is not up to your eyeballs and weeds or anything else. He takes care of that, he takes care of his neighbors. So. It's, it's just an idea for us that he wants something nice and he wants to share it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Further comment? Hello, my name is Marilyn Sneed. And of course, I'm asking you to approve this request. First of all, I'd like to say I'm very impressed with the discussion of the council you have really raised some good issues. One of the questions was why he wants this manufactured home versus a modular home. This man is 100% disabled. He suffers from tremendous post-traumatic stress. My husband works with him and they're going to combat vet counseling. He does not want the hassle of having to move somewhere or stay somewhere while a modular home is being set up. 100% disabled. All he wants to be able to do is get the old home moved out, move in the new one. When all this started, I asked him, why are you going to do this? Just put it in a modular home. And he explained why. And then I said, well, why don't you just move out of the city? He said, no, he loves San Angelo. And this is important. It's two lots, but it is land. And on his father's deathbed, he asked Mr. Winford to take care of his property. Could you speak into the mic, please? Okay, did you hear that um, on his deathbed, his father asked him to please take care of his property. It is his family's legacy, and he is very proud of it. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Susie Soto. I own the property immediately across the street to the east from the property you are discussing today. My property is, thank you. My property is own one multi-family residence and is among the nicest, more upscale properties within this neighborhood. I am 100% in favor of this zone change. It is a good thing for our neighborhood. Please vote to allow this man to bring his new home into our neighborhood. Our area needs these upgrades and welcomes this example of safe and affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you very much. For the comment? No further comment. We will take a vote, and I understand that we need a 6-0 vote in order for it to pass. Um, the motion that has been presented is that we approve this manufactured home to be put um, on Mr. Um, Whitfield's property, and that at the same point in time, we ask that um, the planning department relook at this ordinance and um, address some changes in the ordinance moving forward. All in favor, say yes. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. All right, we move to item C. 
First reading public hearing for case Z1703, an ordinance approving a request for a rezoning from the general commercial heavy commercial CGCH zoning district to the heavy commercial CH zoning district located at 1604 South Bryant Boulevard. John James, you're on. Or Mr. John or Mr. James? <laughs> Two first names. So. Two first names. What are you going to do? Or Jones. I was going to say it may be Mr. Jones for all we know. Thank you. Um, get to the right presentation. Again, I am John James, uh, Director of Planning and Development Services. Um, this is a request for rezoning from CGCH, which is a combination district of general and heavy commercial, to straight heavy commercial zoning. Uh, it's corner of Bryant and Avenue L. And you can see here uh, the general location on the map. Uh, the designated future land use in our comprehensive plan is for commercial uh, in this area. Uh, you can see neighborhood center uh, and neighborhood, which are lower intensity zoning districts, uh, but then, or not zoning, but future land use designations, but then the, this larger area is largely uh, commercial designation. Um, part of why that's relevant is you can see here there's lot manufacturing zoning uh, as well as the, the general and heavy commercial uh, zoning. The idea in the adopted comprehensive plan is that uh, this area uh, has developed over time as commercial, not heavy commercial or light manufacturing, and so the more appropriate zoning long term is for this to be uh, the commercial zoning. Uh, this is just the general area. As I mentioned, uh, the uses in the area largely have been general commercial in nature. Uh, you can see here is the, is the sign for the existing business on the, the subject property. Uh, and again, just looking up and down the street, uh, hotels, restaurants, uh, commercial activity. And so I just wanted to give a brief comparison of the CGCH zoning, which is the current zoning, and the uh, heavy commercial that's being requested. Um, the retail sales and service, uh, s some of that would not be allowed in the heavy commercial zoning. So if we were to zone the whole area uh, heavy commercial, uh, much of what's there now would no longer be allowed. Um, in the proposed zoning, these are all uses that are not currently allowed, or at least not without a special approval, uh, but that would now become allowed uh, if we rezone this property to heavy commercial. Uh, so the, and the, the summary of that is uh, the heavy commercial zoning allows a more intensive, heavier type of use on the property that generally don't exist uh, in this area and would be creating basically an island of heavy commercial in an area that we don't believe is appropriate for heavy commercial zoning. Um, Fast. Uh, the primary reason for this is not to do heavy commercial activity on the property. Uh, the primary reason is that um, in the past the council has adopted a policy that uh, billboard signs only be located in the areas shown on the corridor shown in red on this map or in heavy commercial and industrial areas. The idea was that the, the clutter of signs and billboards should not be as pervasive uh, outside of these primary highway corridors uh, or in industrial and heavy commercial areas. Uh, again, we don't believe this is a heavy commercial area regardless of, of the zoning. Uh, and so based on that prior council direction in terms of our sign ordinance, um, again, at least similar to the previous case, a previous council has determined this particular area to be inappropriate for billboards. And so what they're asking for is a rezoning specifically to allow a billboard uh, on this property. Uh, again, I'm not going to read through all these. It's in your staff report, but I basically just summarized our rationale for why we recommended denial uh, of this rezoning. Uh, we don't believe it's appropriate to rezone a single property to a different zoning district. Uh, number one, simply for the purpose of a sign, and number two, something that's inconsistent with the existing uses in the uh, surrounding area. We did send out our notifications, uh, did not receive any responses. And so what comes to you is a recommendation from staff for uh, either denial or approval of general commercial instead. Uh, the Planning Commission did vote to approve, however, uh, it was a 4-2 vote. Happy to answer any questions. 
Brenda, this is in my area. What I'd like to say is, is I believe that uh, the denial of this particular uh, application is probably appropriate. I don't want to see any more signs in that particular area, so I would move to deny this. I second that motion. I have one question that I didn't think of yesterday when you and I spoke, John. If we did even rezone this for appropriate for the sign, wouldn't that clearly conflict with the sign ordinance anyways? So you would have to go through two different motions to amend that Well, based on that map where you saw right there. Remember, though, that the sign ordinance says uh, in any commercial district, you can have a billboard in these red corridors. But if you're in heavy commercial or industrial, you can have a billboard also. Okay. The idea was um, in general commercial areas, the policy is signs should only be allowed in these red areas. But if you get into a heavier commercial and industrial type area, then billboards may be appropriate in, in those areas as well. So if you rezone this heavy commercial under the sign ordinance, then it becomes appropriate for a billboard. Okay. And one thing I didn't say is if you think that a billboard is appropriate in this location, the our preference would be for you to look at modifying the sign ordinance to make that change and say this is an area where billboards are okay rather than sort of a backdoor approach by zoning it a, a district that we think is incompatible. I do not support changing the zoning for this. I don't believe it should be a CH. I believe that it opens up the door to many other issues, some that were addressed a couple years ago. And um, I don't want to open that door again. So I would not be in support of changing to CH. Mayor, I agree with you. All right, any further questions, comments? Public comment. Good morning, Mayor, Council, Russell with SKG Engineering. If, if you look and dive deeper into the zoning ordinance, um, what's allowed there. We're not bringing in a heavy commercial zoning. Uh, it already exists on the property. The CGCH zoning allows heavy commercial property. If, if you read through the, the use table of the zoning ordinance, um, it, it it's, talks about um, manufacturing and production light, and it has a little hash mark there, and it says see other categories. You flip over to the other categories, and what it says that's allowed in this CGCH zoning is food and beverage processing, drug processing, tobacco manufacture, building material processing, light metal fabrication. So there is the opportunity in, under this CGCH zoning for some heavy activity to take place. Uh, so what we're asking for actually is to go to the CH zoning, one, which would now prohibit all of this stuff that I just read to you and allow for the billboard to be placed there. I don't know if we can go back, if I'm, I don't know if I'm qualified to operate this, but maybe go back to the map, this map here. As John, Mr. Jones, James spoke about, <laughs> you know, if, if we were in the light manufacturing district, we could place the billboard at this location. You know, the, the other map where the red lines go, you can have them, as he said, irregardless of the zoning district. But, but within in areas outside of those red lines, you have to have this specific zoning. So across the street is the light manufacturing zoning, and there's a billboard there. Um, across Bryan, across Avenue L, it's the light manufacturing zoning, and there's a billboard over there. So, so this area, um, fits you, you have because this is on a TxDOT corridor you have to go to TxDOT and get a permit from them and and this location is the really the only lo location in this area that meets the TxDOT separation so so this property um, because of its location fits and, and 
and we're representing the chick. You know, there's a new Chick Fil A at the at the corner. Uh, this this developed, and, and they were looking for signs to point people to their direction. So they've they've gone to our client and asked for a billboard in this area. So this billboard is going to generate revenue for the city. So in some. We're asking for a zoning that would allow for the installation of an off-site sign and still allow for the current business to operate while being cohesive with the surrounding properties. So, so we're truly downgrading ever so slightly this property. And, and so it, it's a small property. Uh, some of the activity that Mr. James pulled up. Uh, this property is so small, it, it wouldn't be conducive for a business to run there. Tough Shine is going to continue to operate as it is. Um, so we would ask, we have the motion ahead of us, so we have the headwinds here. We ask that you um, vote against that and, and have a motion to, to approve it as a CH zoning. Thank you. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. This is on the northbound side, right? Correct. All right. So, and if it's Chick Fil A that's wanting to put up the sign, it's behind him, correct? It's a. It'll be a double-sided sign, in, up high. On so, the other side. So, so you'll be able to see it as you're headed south. Any question? Any further? Have, well, our client is here that, uh, to talk about maybe some specifics to the sign and a little bit of uh, what he has envisioned uh, with respect to taking down the existing sign and, and placing their, their sign as well. I said free coupons. We got to go beyond three. We could be in trouble. I apologize. I really did. <laughs> you should have seen me at the office yesterday trying to uh, put that together. By the way, uh, okay. So my name my name is Doug Cooper, and I own Southwest Outdoor Advertising, small business here in town. Been a part of San Angelo for ten years now. Um, so. Basically, what I do is I obviously build billboards and, and lease them out, and it's a basically it's a cost-effective means for people in town to advertise, right? Um, so we talked about Chick Fil A. Um, so Rob Watkins, he, he our local Chick Fil A owner, he called me last fall and um, said he needed a billboard for the new for his new location that he was building on Knickerbocker. So he's um, I said, well, okay, I'll, I'll see what I can do. And he told me the location and everything. And so what I did was I, uh, I drove the location and everything and, and made sure that everything was okay. I said that there was an there was antiquated part of the language that says you can't build a billboard north of San Jacinto um, on, on South Bryan. Um, but I'll say, let's see what we can do, whatever. So anyways. Um, Location that meets all the rules and regulations, and when I say all the rules, rules and regulations, it meets all the textile rules and regulations. It meets the city of San Angelo minus this old cutoff rule. Um, so it's it's the currently it's currently zoned CGCH, which allows for billboards in all the other areas of town. Um, it's more than 500 foot away from other billboards. Textile only calls for 300 foot. It's more than 100 foot from any residential zone. And it meets all the setbacks. Um, 
So Paul, Paul Ostrander and his wife own Tough Shine, and um, I approached them, and uh, they wanted to – they agreed, obviously. It helps them generate revenue from their property, right, um, to build a 300-square-foot sign. So it's the smallest sign, basically billboard sign, that you can build in Texas. Um, so I applied for the TxDOT permit at the location – they text out, sent out their building inspector. Everything meets their rules and regulations. They issued me a um, building permit, um, and that's in y'all's handout there. Um, and so knowing that it's just bad business to just apply for a uh, zone change without giving you all a reason for why we're doing the zone change, um, I scheduled a meeting with John and uh, Al Torres, and we tried to figure out a way, okay, how can we put a sign here? Okay, this is... Um, so anyways, um, during the meeting, there were two options, basically. It was a text amendment to the sign code, okay, or a zone change. Um, because for some reason, you can't just get a sign variance in the in city of San Angelo to allow for a billboard, okay. So we went with the, um, the zone change option. Um, so this isn't a new deal. You guys actually, and that's in y'all's um, handout there, y'all approved a zone change for a billboard in December, Okay, um, the exact same situation. It was the whole vet case in December. They wanted to place a billboard on a piece of property that wasn't zoned correctly. Okay, um, so knowing that that's their only remedy to allow for an off site sign in that location, they had to go for the zone change. Um, it was approved. Y'all approved the zone change, and um, so that's that. And it wasn't actually Mr. Holvec. It was um, a company called Signad, which is the largest billboard company privately owned in Texas. Um, that did that. So that was approved. So y'all approved that in December. So there's going to be um, a sign over there on 306. Anyways, um, so this is a commercial corridor. I know, and I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to wrap it up. Okay, you see a picture right there of an existing pole, right? Um, that's an old sign. It's a 24-inch column, 30-foot tall that's sitting there. So what I'm proposing is I'm going to take that pole down. So it's just a dilapidated sign. We're removing that sign and replacing it with a 24-inch column for a sign for, for Chick-fil-A, okay? Um, and so it's really a net zero. I mean, I'm taking one sign down, taking one sign down, putting another sign up, and it's a better looking sign, right? Um, so, you know, really what we have here is two local companies, Southwest Outdoor, Chick-fil-A, that we're just trying to figure out a, a solution to the problem here, and this is our only remedy for the solution is a zone change or a text amendment to the the sign ordinance. Um, so I just ask you to approve this and, and you know, can I ask, answer any questions? I mean, I've tons of knowledge here in terms of what I'm sure you all have questions. Does someone have further question? I guess I have a question for John. Maybe it's for both Doug and John. I'm not sure. Let me ask the question. Absolutely. Um, the issue you just addressed, uh, you're going to take down that one pole. I guess, John, this is for you, I guess. Had they utilized that pole, and just could they have just set this sign on top of this existing pole with no issues whatsoever? No, because our ordinance regulates on-site signs differently than billboards that are intended to advertise for something that's off-site. Um, and so in this location, under this current zoning, all that's allowed is an on-site sign. So the only sign you can put on the property is advertising a business on that property. It seems sort of dramatic to have to have a zoning change to get a sign. On the other hand, I don't believe that this area should become heavy manufacturing. So the question is, is, is it lot specific only for zone change? And should we be looking at sign change versus zone change? Because when you get into zone changing, I think you open up the door to other conversations about other things that could be brought to the table and put there, and that very much concerns me in terms of a zone change. What change? As, as I, I'm sorry, as I said, that was that would be our preference. If you think this sign is appropriate for a billboard, our preference would be to modify the sign ordinance to make this a corridor where billboards are okay. Amend the sign ordinance to allow billboards but at this Today, location. basically, we're making a decision about a zoning change. 
Correct. That, yeah. Yeah. The only thing you can do today is the zone change. An option would be to deny this, as we've recommended, but ask us to come back with changes uh, to the sign ordinance. Okay. If you, again, if you think billboards are appropriate for this corridor. And while I'm here, let me make one comment about the, uh, he mentioned the zone change that you all approved recently. I'll note that that is in this corridor, and so that's a big difference in our minds is, is that that one was in an area that the sign ordinance generally specifies as okay for billboards. I have any further public comment. Would looking at this backwards, I say, and this goes back to you, John. If I turn the microphone on, it works a little better. Um, if you backed it up to light manufacturing on the request, would that not comply and everything and give us some protection? Well, about actually, what they could do there? Light manufacturing allows higher intensity of uses than heavy commercial. So in the in the spectrum, general commercial is is less less intense then heavy commercial, then light manufacturing, and then heavy manufacturing, of course. You answered that. Thank you. Russell with SKG. The, uh, the other case uh, for Holvac, we went to, we did a PD, a Planned Development District zoning, to where we could get very specific on what was allowed there and what was not allowed there. Um, that one went through. It was under a one acre. We, made we were going to make application for this one as a PD, so we could tailor the zoning to it, but um, there's a little caveat in the ordinance that says you can't do a PD for property under one acre. So if we're going to be looking at some zones, some changes to some ordinances, maybe we need to look at what's magical about doing a PD or why couldn't you do one for a property under one acre uh, if it could fit a niche or a need. So maybe we can direct staff to look at that one as well. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Yes, sir. Or, or simply a sign variance for, you know, or a special use permit for situations like this, where the thing is, is that for Mr. Watkins, there are no other signs in the air, that entire stretch of South Bryant. He cannot advertise on any other signs there, okay? So, yes, there's other, there's other old uh, off-site signs there, but those are owned by Lamar Outdoor Advertising, okay? And so they're called... Rotary, they're on the Rotary program, which means that it's national advertisers and or local advertisers that are okay with switching their location forever, you know, wherever Lamar wants to put them. So Rob needs to have an off-site sign directing traffic, people going down South Bryant to turn onto Knickerbocker or a or you turn at so-and-so and turn out. So he has no other option. There are no other signs that he can advertise on. So it seems, it's, yes, it de does seem crazy to have to get a zone change to allow for a sign when it seems like there's a lot other um, less drastic measures, that there should be less drastic measures to allow for a special use situation like this. Can Thank I, you. Okay. <laughs> cool. for, for the comment, Jim. Yes, my name is uh, Jim Turner. I'm on the zoning board, and this doesn't have to do with my time on the zoning board, but one of the things that you have to watch when you're doing these small zone changes, Texas law also doesn't allow what's called spot zoning, where you just kind of, for one special circumstance, zone that, that very different from the rest of the area. Zoning is supposed to be f for a broad policy for an area. If the sign ordinance or some other ordinance there doesn't allow a use that would be appropriate there, then that ordinance needs to be changed, probably not the zoning. The sign ordinance probably is due for being reviewed again. It's been probably 10, 15 years since major changes were done to it. They've done a lot of tinkering with it since then. But especially on an area like this, where you have a type of sign that's not a constantly changing billboard, but it also doesn't fit in with the uh, current sign ordinance, it would be very appropriate there. It's the, probably the best sign you could have there in a lot of ways. Then we probably need to fix the sign ordinance and not do what basically amounts to a spot zoning of one little small lot in a sea of other type zoning. Thank you. Thank you. 
Any further comment? All right, I have a motion and a second to um, not, I should say, make sure I say this right, to deny the request for rezoning from general commercial, heavy commercial to heavy commercial. I'll take a vote. All in favor of not approving the rezoning, say aye. 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 Any opposed? I think people are requesting a break, so mm -hmm. let's just do it quick, uh, 10 minutes, and we'll be back. Bring the council meeting back to order, and we are going to move on to section D. First reading and public hearing of an ordinance approving a request for the vacation and abandonment of approximately 0.416 acres, segment of the North Harrison Street public street right of way, generally located between Woodlawn Drive and Forest Park Avenue. John James, Mr. Jones. Thank you again, John James, uh, Director of Planning and Development Services. Uh, this is a street abandonment. As you can see from the graphic here, it is running through uh, a park. And so it's basically a, although it is technically a city street, uh, it's, it's uh, running through the middle of a park. As part of uh, the Parks Department's plans for that park, uh, and including construction of trails and some other things you've seen, um, they are asking to abandon this as a public street through the middle of the park so that they can do some different things. Uh, you can see here it is all parkland. Uh, it, it is a continuation of Harrison Street, which basically tees into Webster at this point. Uh, as we've, we, we held a meeting with the neighborhood, had a couple people come or a few people come and ask questions. Um, not uh, any opposition, so to speak. Um, so, in fact, we notified, I don't think we have that on the map, but we notified a much larger area than we normally do, two to three blocks out in either direction, just to make sure that people in the neighborhood, if this is a street they use every day, they had an opportunity to come and speak and uh, give us input if, if this was something they didn't want to see closed. Now, when we say closed, we're abandoning it as a public street. That doesn't necessarily mean that the street will be closed to traffic. Uh, one, one of the options that Carl is looking at is, is basically keeping it for parking, keeping it as a internal park drive, but maybe doing some things to you know, restrict the, the width or other things to keep through traffic from, from cutting through there. Um, again, as we looked at the area, it's, it's very lightly utilized, mostly from park users. There's not a lot of through traffic. It's not a major through street, uh, so we don't think it'll affect the, the surrounding neighbors uh, significantly. Uh, the, you can see this is the area we notified, uh, 157 total notices uh, to everyone in this blue area. Uh, that's really the area we thought uh, of residents that might use this street on a daily basis. Again, we did not receive any formal responses. Uh, as I mentioned, we did hold a public meeting, uh, also no um, opposition from the neighborhood at that point. So what's before you is a uh, recommendation from staff. Uh, and the Planning Commission unanimously to uh, abandon that 382-foot segment of North Harrison Street. Uh, we did recommend a condition of approval, and that's simply to replat the property to make it all one uh, tract of parkland. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Does anyone have any questions? Second. I, w I have a question before we do. Um, my concern is, is there isn't a final yes or no in terms of traffic on that street because if you're going to allow parking, one of the issues with needing to abandon that is the safety issue for kids running through from one side to the other. And if it's not, quote, being closed to the public, but it might be used for parking, are you really addressing the bigger issue? And that issue is the safety issue that exists with that running through the middle of the park. And I know that Carl is is aware of that issue, and they're in the process now of designing the trails and improvements to the park, and we'll definitely take that into account in terms of their design and how they orient uh, the parking and where the trails cross uh, and all of that will be considered. I just wanted to make the point that your action today simply removes it as a public street. The decision of how to reorient or to you know, what to do with the actual pavement on the ground is a decision for later down the road. 
Okay. Lucy, did you have a motion? Yes, ma'am, I did. To approve as presented. Do I have a second? Second. Do I have any public comment? Yes, sir. My name is Clinton Dooley. I live in the area. I just have a question, really. Um, two years ago, a little over two years ago, there was a, a, a huge rain that happened in San Angelo that came through that park area. And I live close to this area, and I've talked to Lucy about some of my uh, concerns on this. Um, but the part of that road was washed out, and part of uh, Monroe, further down, was washed out. Harrison Street was repaired and fixed up and patched, and is now open for traffic. Monroe Street is still uh, closed off and can't have traffic go through. You spent this money to be, fill up this road and fix it. Now you're going to close down the pu the public when this other road is still not usable. It's kind of un I don't understand um, why the why the section's been taken. Who brought this up this time? That's the only question I have. Thank you. Thank you. Further public comment. Answer that partly by saying that the Parks Department is the applicant in this case, and so the city has uh, applied for this closing on, be on behalf of the Parks Department. All in favor say yes. Aye. Aye. Any negatives? No. Thank you. Item E, first reading and public hearing of an ordinance amending Chapter 11.02.043 Raw Water Permit in Appendix A, Article A8.000, Untreated Water Rates and Raw Water Permit Fee. Uh, Director Bill Riley, you're on. Thank you, ma'am. Mayor, Council, uh, good morning. Uh, I want to uh, cut, have a couple of issues here uh, this morning. One is to uh, delete from the ordinance some uh, outdated language pertaining to uh, using water from the lake, and the other one is to look at the actual rate for the, uh, the use of the uh, raw water from the lake. Uh, just as a matter of a little bit of history, uh, prior to 2011, um, in order to use water from the lake, uh, it was not metered, but you had to pay uh, uh, an annual fee of $360, and then you could pump water from the lake to use for uh, for irrigation. Unfortunately, our, our um, the fact of the matter is, is the use of that water from the lake is actually counted against us, against our water right uh, for the, the water that we have allocated out of Twin Buttes and, and Lake Nasworthy. And so we have to report that usage to, uh, to the TCEQ uh, on a monthly basis. In fact, we have to tell them how much we're going to take and then we true that up after we, we read all the meters. So that water had to be metered and we had to report that. Okay, so. Uh, beginning in 2011, in order to account for that, I would begin to install meters for the use of that. The, at that time, the fee was changed, and, and looking and trying to recognize the value of that water, a tiered rate structure like most irrigation rate structures was put in place that uh, the more the water you use, the more, the more that it costs per thousand gallons. When we went through the uh, rate study, uh, one of the things we looked at, of course, was all of the rate structures, and, and that one in particular did not have enough usage to justify all of the uh, rate tiers, and those are, are difficult to manage and for part of our billing system, so there's no reason to continue to that. So just in its simplest form, what we did was we took the um, revenue that was being generated and developed a flat rate to basically make that revenue neutral. Uh, what it did, though, is it did make that rate uh, somewhat more than the... Um, residential uh, rate use. So backing up just a minute and looking at the, the what's currently in the ordinance is the, it's still in the ordinance that we charge the, the way it was done uh, over six years ago that we charge a flat fee, uh, a permit, annual permit. And so we just need to remove that language. And so that's the first thing that we need to do is just take that out because it's no longer applicable at all. And so then the second part of this would be to look at what we do with the, with the current rate structure, since I do understand that there, it does have some concern uh, that people would say, I'm, char I'm using uh, raw water out of the lakes, not being treated, and it, and it costs more than, uh, than the other. So uh, I, th I think that that's a le legitimate question uh, and one that we, we need to address and one that we need to take a look at. But I think it's also important to understand that the use of that water does take away part of the water that we use to serve the citizens of San Angelo. So the use of that water is not really any different than using other water. It deletes or, or removes uh, water from our, um, 
portfolio. So we need to make sure that we, we price it appropriately and that we recognize that it is being used for irrigation. I mean, it's being put on the ground, so we need to, to recognize that. And in as such, we have a landscaping rate that is in, in place, uh, so it seems appropriate that we would just apply the landscape rate uh, to that since it's being used uh, accordingly. The other thing that, that is important to, to note with this is that when the Hickory project was built, uh, as part of the easements that were, were granted uh, for that line, there were uh, the opportunity for individuals to get meters and tie on to that line. The rate structures for most of those contracts tied directly back to our raw water rate. So th this it isn't just the lake water, it's also the use off of the Hickory line, and quite frankly we just don't need to encourage that. Uh, it, it could have an impact on the amount of water that we have. Again, it is taken away from our portfolio, so we need to price it appropriately and recognize the value of that water. So what we're recommending is that we uh, change the, the uh, raw water rate from the flat fee that we had to a, uh, the landscape rate, which would lower the rate uh, from 565 flat fee to the 509 for the first 89,000 gallons. And then as the landscape rate, as you can see here, uh, as you get over 89,000 gallons, it goes up um, considerably. Again, recognizing the, the use of that water and, and the value uh, of that water. Now, in doing that, uh, we would see probably overall uh, about a $10,000 a year decrease in the revenue that's generated from, uh, from the uh, uh, lake use. Uh, but just in uh, full understanding of the impacts of this, there are uh, a few accounts, about eight accounts, that would actually see uh, an increase uh, because they routinely use more than 89,000 gallons. And so, of course, one of those is golf course. They would probably see the largest impact. Uh, a church that owns property out on, on Lake Nasworthy, and then two homes uh, that, have, that have gone over 89,000 gallons, and so they would see a, a, an increase in their, their monthly rate if we switch to this. However, they do have the opportunity under, under this scenario to keep their usage under the 89,000 gallons a month and see uh, a decrease in their, in their monthly bill. So with that, we would... Um, recommend to you that we change that rate to the landscape rate and uh, be effective August 1st. Do I have questions? I have, I have a question, Bill. I think I heard you say um, in so many words, um, but maybe for clarification for me, um, the, the, the water that is used, the raw water that is used is included, all of that is included with the household use as well, um, in terms of having to to to, to pay for the that and the, the same thing. So, are I'm thick-headed here. Are we changing just that raw water? Are we changing the, what they're paying for raw water plus the treated water? No, we're just recommending what's what uh, for the raw water. The raw water usage out of the lake is kept complete is metered separately and kept completely separate than any of the other use. We still have to account for that. We do. Um, with TCEQ. We have to report that monthly to the TCEQ. Okay. Okay. Thanks. There's been some other questions if I may, that, uh, concerning the how, uh, pertaining to that same question, uh, Councilman Hebert, is do we use that water when we, when we uh, apply the sewer rate? Uh, and, and we do not. It's completely separate. It's not used. Th that consumption is not used in setting the, the uh, winter average for the sewer. They're completely separate. And we, don't, we do not, even in instances where we have, where individuals all throughout town have a separate sprinkler meter, that sprinkler meter, that's the reason we do that, is that they're not, that usage is not used in calculating the winter average for sewer. They're, they're separate. And the homeowners at Lake Nasworthy have said what? Most of them have, well, no. We have heard that there's some concerns uh, from some that, that not understanding why they would pay more for untreated water than they do for treated water. And that's a legitimate question. So hence, it is now being lowered. It is. Okay. Yes, because I had received a letter from a constituent out there and uh, he had mentioned that he was not, he didn't understand why he was drink, why he was being charged more for raw water than drinking water. So, 
Bill, you and I had this conversation last fall uh, on a couple of constituents out there, and you certainly explained it to me, and I was able to relay that information to them uh, about why the raw water at that point in time was was higher, uh, and they didn't understand that uh, that that we had to report all that usage to TCEQ and, and state agencies. So. Uh, they were they were not happy, but they were they were satisfied. We were able to answer the question anyway. Any further comment? Question? Do I have a motion? Oh, public comment. None. No more public comment. We don't have a motion. Uh uh. -oh. We didn't have a motion. <laughs> yeah, move to approve as presented. Just ahead of myself. I'm yeah, sorry. sorry. Do I have a motion, please? Move to approve as presented. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Okay. All right. We're going to get an. Um, Tina Dursky is going to give us an update on sales tax revenue, please. Good morning, Mayor, Council, City Manager. I'm Tina Dursky, the Director of Finance, and I just have a quick update for you. You did see this in your Friday packets a couple weeks ago, but we want to update the public as well. We saw sales tax up in June of 12.25% compared with the same month in the prior year. Uh, we are still, however, under our original revenue budget by $574,000 year to date. I also want to point out that um, $180,000 of our sales tax revenue for the month of June was due to an audit adjustment by the state comp comptroller, and so we feel like our, our numbers may not have been quite as positive um, if we didn't include that in our calculations. Um, it would have been closer to about 3.6% up. You have any questions? I'll be happy to answer. And that's actually for the month of April. Collections in April, yes, ma'am. So net effect is a three percent increase, not twelve point two five percent. But we, that if we did not include the bad. audit adjustment, yes, ma'am, it'd be about three point six percent increase. We'll take that right now. I mean, yeah, we'll take it. Down, so. We're not going <laughs> to decline good. it. It's so. good. We'll take some more next month too. Yeah. Wait, do you get any uh, bi-monthly reports? We do not. Any questions? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Keep it moving this direction. Yes, positive. All right, we're going to have a second reading and adoption of an ordinance removing the purchasing policy from the Code of Ordinances and requiring the policy to be adopted by City Council through resolution and to a resolution adopting the June 2017 pur purchasing policy. Jay and Tilly. Hi, Julia Antley, Purchasing Manager. Uh, just uh, to kind of go over what we discussed last time, this will be cleaning up our city's code of ordinance by removing policy level details, and then we'll be adopting the full purchasing policy by resolution, and that was included in the background. Um, key changes for council, as we discussed last time, they'll actually be none. Um, per the code um, set aside by the state law, all purchases over 50000 are required to be approved and authorized by city council, so you'll continue to see those. And then the council will still be approving the purchasing policy. It would just be by resolution rather than ordinance. And the, these are the key changes that the internal customers will see, our staff. There'll be quotes now required on purchases over $3,000, and, and we will be requiring three quotes now, which will just kind of give us a better um, value pricing rather than um, two quotes. We'll be able to see a little bit more about um, whether or not the um, pricing seems to be reasonable. Um, managers will now be authorized to approve items up to $15,000. And then the last three items are really just housekeeping. We'll be outlining methods for um, purchasing computers, furniture, and uniforms, which were not previously included. And then the next two are set by the state. We'll be renumbering any sort of statutes that have been previously misnumbered. And then we'll be doing construction bids by lowest responsible bidder. So when you say outlines purchasing method for computers, furniture, and uniforms, how is that different? Um, previously, those just were not addressed, and so we've added those to the policy. Okay. To 
Risa, question for you: um, Are we able? Do we do we need to approve one and two separately and individually? That's what Brian was just yes. saying. We need, do need to approve the ordinance right. first and then the policy okay. second. Move to approve as presented, number one. I second. Any questions, comments, public comment? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? No. All right. And then two, a resolution adopting the June 2017 purchasing policy. Move approval, number two. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any public comment? Approved as presented. We're now going to move into closed session. Executive session under the provision of Government Code Title V, Open Government, Ethics, Subtitle A, Government, Open Government, Chapter 551, Open Meetings, Subchapter D, Exceptions to Requirement that Meetings be Open under the following sections. A, Section 551.071A, consult with attorney when the governmental body seeks the advice of its attorney about pending a contemplated litigation regarding Alsay Incorporated versus City of San Angelo, Texas Corallo Engineers, City of San Angelo versus Spillman Technologies. B, Section 551072, deliberations about real property regarding 703 South Chaburn and Lake Nasworthy residential lot leases. Minutes. And we'll be gone for about 20 minutes.